Saint Isaac the Syrian, Bishop of Nineveh, uh, he talks about the importance of uh, solitude. Solitude. Now he's usually applying it uh, to monastic life, but it applies to all ascetics. And we are ascetics, whether we're married, single, or not in a monastery, we still have the same, we do the same things in the sense of uh, fasting and prayer. These are the main things. Um, so he's talking about, in fact, every, every Christian is an ascetic. If they're not an ascetic, they're not a Christian. It's as simple as that. St. Seraphim said that if you don't fast on Wednesdays and Friday, you can't really be called a Christian. So we are ascetics. Now, we may be very weak ones, not very good at it, asceticism, but that's what we are. This is what our faith is, an ascetical faith. So solitude applies to us as well. Now, this is a little bit philosophical because um, St. Isaac says that um, the solitary in, in, sorry, in Aramaic, no, Aramaic, sorry. Syriac, Syriac thank you. In Syriac, it means a single one, one person. So the, so the word solitude and being a single person is, is the same word, has the same um, connection. And he says that it's to, when you say that somebody is single, it means that they're a unity in themselves. They know who they are. They're not driven by all the stuff that goes on in the world out there, but they are single and they have a unity with themselves. We have to be at unity with ourselves in order to, be with, to have unity with God. Now, we all know this because we cannot pray if we're distracted. We cannot be single in our thought. If you say a person, you know, in a worldly sense, is single in their, in their attitude, it means that they're really concentrating on what they're doing. That's single and not think about anything else, but that single thought. So that's the connection. And, and St. Isaac calls it solitude because he's also talking about physical solitude. And he's recommending that if you want to be a good monk, then you should be a, a solitary. This is a higher calling. Now, for us, when we think of being solitary, we think, oh, that means being lonely. And loneliness is burdensome. Nobody wants to be lonely. But from the talk last week, as you remember, we can't be lonely. It's impossible to be in Christ and to be lonely because we're connected to everybody. Now, obviously, there's physical loneliness, which is, is a burden to bear, but we're not alone because the moment, because we are part of the body of Christ, so we are not, there's no such thing as loneliness. We may feel it, but that is actually a temptation. Adam's title, according to St. Isaac, was the, was the singular one. That was his title. One made in the image of God, says St. Isaac. One made in the image of God. And God himself is one. We know God in three persons, but he is one in essence. He is, uh, a Christ is the only begotten son. So this, this idea of singleness, one. I'm sorry, it is, it is sort of philosophical, the way I'm presenting it. A solitary, according to St. Isaac, is one who lives in Christ. So all of us are solitaries if we live in Christ. As Christians, we are solitary. Not physically, necessarily. And in some cases, it's not advisable. It's not a good thing. Um, certainly for a monk um, to go into solitary, to live as a, as a solitary, as a hermit, is a special blessing. And uh, the fathers say, you know, somebody says, well, I'd like to go and live on my own and, you know, pray all day. And, and, so, and they say, no, you're not ready. Until you're ready, you can do that because you really are, in, you're entering the spiritual world into a dimension where there is darkness. Now on the Holy Mountain, um, if somebody's going to be tonsured a monk, and this is in community, uh, that night, and I've heard this, I haven't heard it myself, 
but I've heard it said that that night there is bedlam, chaos. All night there's shouting and banging of doors before the, before the, the, the monk is tonsured. This is the demons. And on the holy mountain, the demons can be physical and can attack people and beat them up. And they end up with black eyes in the morning. So this is another world. So you don't really want to be a solitary in that sense unless you have a special blessing. A solitary is one who lives in Christ. So solitary is not celibacy. So you can be married and be a solitary in the sense that you are in Christ and that your thoughts are always of Christ. That's single thinking, not diver diverted. Because in, 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 uh, in reality, of course, we're, we're burdened all the time. The moment we pray, all this stuff comes into our brains. Pamirki, interference. So we, we know it is very hard to be solitary in prayer, but that's what we, we aim for. Not solitary from people, but, but in prayer. So we can concentrate, basically. That's what it's about. Solitary, it says, it says um, loneliness, according to St. Isaac, is an experience of the presence of God. I think that's the answer to that. We go somewhere and we pray quietly, say five minutes in our room, lock the door, you know, keep get away from people and pray. We're in the presence of God. That's what it's for. Not because we don't want to talk to people or because we're feeling uh, off socially. That's not, that's not the right attitude. It, it's a positive thing. Solitude. Um, it says that when we are in the presence of God, we, God is closer to us when we're quiet. I think all of this makes, makes a, is common sense to us in our spiritual struggle. God reveals himself in stillness. Solit solitude is necessary for uniting oneself with God. Unity with God is preceded by detachment from matter. Now I'll elaborate on that. But let me just go over this again. To be, you have to be quiet if you want to hear the voice of God. You're not going to hear the voice of God if your mind is totally consumed by the news, especially at the moment, especially here in Seattle, and the rioting. You can't concentrate on prayer. It's impossible. And as I said to you before, do not let the outside world into your families, into your homes, into your lives. Don't let it happen. So you limit um, your reading news on the internet we, we can't help it we're curious we want to know what's happened next you know this is unfortunately um, we're all tempted by that and if you remember in in the story of Elijah it wasn't until he was quiet that he heard the voice of God after the fire the earthquake the, and whatever then there was a still small voice it says like actually it says like a gentle breeze the voice of God was like a gentle breeze well, you can't have a gentle breeze if you're in chaos, worried about this, noise going on, you know what I mean, in your heads all the time. We have to have that solitude. So this is what it means by solitude. It's very positive. It's wonderful because then we can be still with God. No one can approach God without withdrawing from the world, says St. Isaac. And he says, it's not a change of spiritual dwelling, but withdrawal from worldly affairs. In other words, we have to withdraw from the world, but not in the physical sense. You're not going to go into the desert or into the mountains here to get away from people. That's not what it means. It means away from worldly affairs and concerns. Don't occupy the mind with the world. And then what happens is that grace, this is a wonderful thing about this, is when we start to be quiet with God and we, do not, we are not a, attracted by the things in the world, or at least we can reduce that interest in, in what's going on around us, then grace begins to grow in us. It's not perceptible. Sometimes we feel the grace um, after confession. I certainly feel it in, con in confession. When you're confessing, I feel there's a, a presence of grace, sometimes very strong. Um, 
and in the liturgy, one liturgy, I was talking to somebody in church, I can't remember who it was now, uh, they felt the grace in the liturgy. I felt it exactly at the same time. So that's wonderful to share it. Grace, but usually the grace that we, that we were not aware of increases in us as we begin to try and lead a Christian life. So we're not always conscious of the grace, but it is there. It's there because it's been given to us in baptism. So we have it anyway, but we're not aware of it. That's the difference. Grace increases when, sorry, he's saying, when grace increases, this is a sign, how do you know grace increases? Well, St. Isaac says, when grace increases in us, then we do not fear illness. We're not afraid, not afraid of the virus. We're not afraid of illness as the grace increases in us. We do not fear the apostasy that surrounds us. I don't want to go into details of that. I think you understand what I'm talking about. There's some people just, well, it's um, very sad that people who don't have faith and are worried about the virus. I'm talking about Christians. I'm not talking about the world out there. And so they take extra precautions. There's a lot of stuff going on. And finally, the most important thing, we do not fear death. We don't fear death. And this is because of grace working in us. When grace increases, we are prepared to suffer afflictions as something necessary. That's quite a thought, isn't it? Accepting afflictions and, and troubles because that's necessary for our salvation. This is what separates us uh, actually from Western Christianity, it seems, so I sort of read that in orthodoxy we accept suffering as a part of salvation. Without it, there is no salvation. We accept difficulties. We don't like them. Nobody, we're not masochists. But we do not take uh, precaution. We don't take um, what's the word? action to, to uh, avoid these things. But in fact, we need conflict. It can be great. It can be a great uh, chronic illness. Or it can be just a... a the afflictions that we get from day-to-day -day life. St. Isaac says, but when grace grows less in us, and this is how we can identify it, all that happens to us and with us is the reverse. Complete opposite. So then you know you haven't got grace because you start having fear, anxiety, lack of trust going with what's the flow, as they say, because we don't want to be the odd one out. We're afraid of what people may think. This is a decrease in grace. And grace grows less in, in a man. All that happens to him and with him is the reverse. He examine, begins to, a life, oh yes, life then begins to be based on knowledge rather than on faith. And so we try to work out things. Now, why is this going wrong? Now, I'm not talking uh, about knowledge in a practical sense. You know, there's certain things you do, and if they go wrong, it's because you can, you know, it's, it's something that you did wrong. I mean, I'm talking about on a practical level. But spiritually, a person who loses grace begins to try and solve the things with their mind instead of with their heart, without faith, without prayer. And so... We, we try to solve the problems. Uh, and in this, oh, I don't give details on the virus, but you know, there's certain precautions that we would take rather than have faith in Christ. It because our knowledge and our intellectual um, considerations are more important than faith. That's another sign of lack of faith, of, of um, grace. Trust in God is not present in all he does and divine providence is understood differently. I don't know whether I understand that. How can divine providence be considered differently if you don't have the grace? I can't think of examples. Maybe. Causation. Rather Cause and effect. Rather than it being providence. Yes. 
Yes, I think that yeah, I think that's that's how we we see it. When we have grace, we we providence is a wonderful gift. We trust because we trust God. Without that trust in God, we have to work it out intellectually. We have to um, come up with call. This happened because of this. I mean, there is a depth there that we can you know examine. Such a man is forever subject to fears. To those who lurk to shoot privily at him, as it says in the Psalms. So the demons are with their arrows and are waiting to shoot us when we're scared and we live by a fear. Grace is not in us. The opposite, when we have grace, then we don't fear. St. Isaac says also we have uh, innate desires which we call passions that attract us to worldly things. And this is the reason why we can't renounce the world. It's because we're, we're attracted by things in it. And there's a quote from Proverbs, which he uses, by his sins is everyone put in bondage. And we are bond, we're bound by things of pleasure. He lists actually uh, four things. Um, first thing is, is wine, he mentions wine. This is a temptation of the world which we have to avoid. Women. I like that one. <laughs> Praise glory. Now let's examine it. Wine doesn't mean wine because wine is a gift from God. It's a beautiful thing that God gives. Talking about drunkenness, alcoholism. Women is not disparaging women. We venerate the mother of God. This is, it is misuse of women modern day term is called pornography glory is want to is ambition and wanting to be famous want to be a, a cult a superstar that's quite easy these days actually isn't it to become a superstar with the internet you can be, you know, set yourself up as something and get a few followers and, that, and then you're off you know influencer <laughs> and you might even get paid actually Okay, well, St. Isaac goes on to, to say that we have to trust in divine providence. And he gives an interesting example of, of, of divine providence. It says that um, St. Basil the Great was uh, visiting one of his monasteries um, in Cappadocia. And he goes to the monastery and he says to the abbot, the agumen, he says, do you have any saints? And the agumen said, well, we're all trying to be saints. He said, no, no, have you got any saints? And, he says, oh, yes, I know what you mean. So he calls somebody, a monk, and the monk comes, and he says, uh, the abbot says to the monk, wash my feet. So the, he goes out quickly, gets a bowl of water, comes in, washes his feet. And then St. Basil says, wash my feet. So he does the same. And after it, he says, uh, come to the church tomorrow at the liturgy, and I am going to ordain you. So next day, he, Bishops in the altar serve the liturgy, and this monk comes in and he goes up to the bishop and he says, you said you're going to ordain me. Oh, yes, he said. So he ordains him, probably a deacon. I don't know what. He doesn't say. This is based on divine providence. The monk believed in divine providence. He didn't say, oh, me or not. Obedience. How many of us could live like that? Absolutely trust that whatever happens is from God. If it says, you know, wash my feet, I wash the feet because that's what I've been asked to do. And I'm going to ordain you tomorrow. What's your educational background? Are you suitable? No, the, it's a saint. The abbot says, this is one of our saints, a living saint. It's wonderful. What an example for us all. It's trusting in everything is in God's hands. I have here a question. How do we know we have grace? Well, I would say trusting in God and not living in fear, basically. And he says, do you wish to commune with God in your mind? Yes, we do. That's what we want to do. He says, be merciful. Not practical how you do it, but be merciful. Because God is merciful. It's very, very basic. And he says that when we are going through a time of cooling, when our faith is, is weak and we will get sort of, um, you know, 
losing it, as it were, he says, Zanatina says, remember those times when you were full of zeal. For me personally, it's remembering Pascha. I'm not feeling, you know, things are not going so well as I would like them to go. I think of Pascha and other memories of, of church. So yes, this is, this is good. Go back and think of these things. Take up your cross and follow me. And there are two kinds of cross-bearing. The first one, enduring bodily afflictions, privation. And the second one is a cross of the mind, which is to meditate on God, abiding in prayer. We have to take our cross, um, but we have to understand that the, the beginning of the cross is actually painful. So we have to accept disappointment, afflictions. But if we are thinking of God all the time with our cross, then we are also carrying our cross. I don't really understand that, actually. This is, this is spiritual writing by St. Isaac, and I certainly am not <laughs> capable of understanding it spiritually. He says solitude, through solitude, we develop a healthy intellect, a healthy intellect. The main task is purification of the inner person. And because when we have purification of the inner person, we are then able to love our neighbor. We cannot love our neighbor until we have developed ourselves in prayer. Okay, it's a process. You can't say, I've now developed, I now have inner peace, now I can help the world. No, it's, it's a process. But, but we cannot help our neighbor if we are not spiritually healthy.